I don't think I've ever experienced a year where I am more excited about getting out in the vegetable garden than this year. A lot of reasons for that, but boy, I just can't wait to start. And one of the things that we thought we'd um, like to do this year is talk about some of the neatest, newest varieties that you can you can grow. Maybe introduce you to seeing things you've not tried before. So uh, we'll go through this, and uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, each vegetable individually, but um, I think you'll get an idea of some of the things that are out there, and I'll also try to give you the, the source on some of these as well. But um, one of the things that we've done in Campbell County, and we do here, where the All-America Selection Committee will send us uh, seeds of, of a lot of the ones that they're trialing in their gardens, and we'll put those out and we'll evaluate them here. And uh, it's kind of a neat thing. A lot of the ones that we're going to talk about today are actually All-America selections, and some of them you'll recognize from some of them are pretty old selections. They will actually grow them throughout the United States and all the different climates that we have here, and they will be evaluated, and then they will award the All-America Selection winner uh, award to them, and those are actually become that, and they, uh, the seed companies can uh, charge a little more for those seeds, and are a pretty good plant. Now, we have had some of those that haven't performed all that well for us in the past, uh, I think you can remember there was a uh, seed potato called, um, uh, oh, it was called um, Spud Magic and uh, turned out to be a really poor choice for us. And there have been other ones as well. The tri trial grounds for all America selections. And they actually have a <clears throat> committee that comes through and they will evaluate them and they will put a rating on those. And then those are sent back to the committee and they will kind of tabulate those and they'll determine whether that is going to become an All-America selection or not. So it is a good way to evaluate. But let's, um, and uh, we've got quite a few uh, plants under lights right now, onions, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, all those cool season things. And we'll talk about some of the vegetables that really ought to be started um, out in the garden very soon. And if you haven't started them under lights, well, um, you may be a little bit late on that. But um, beets are one that can do a lot of different things with them. And uh, we've got one here called Avalanche. And you can see that's not the typical beet color, it's white. Um, we also have one called Touchtone Gold, which is a yellow or a, 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 a um, uh, kind of a golden color. And um, they're just really kind of fun to grow. The first beet uh, that was ever used, um, they the, the, the beet juice or the, the color ran, and so that would never be suitable for an American flag. But um, as you know, beet tops can be um, used as greens, and um, they are sensitive to acid soil, but there's a lot of really good ones out there. And this one here is uh, the avalanche beet, which is kind of a neat one. And one of the ones that you're going to get, <clears throat> and uh, it's just an excellent, excellent beat. And it is a, a really good one. And uh, it is an All-America selection as well. So um, that's, a, that's a nice one to try. Um, there's the avalanche again. Just, you know, a lot of different things you can do. If you're thinking about having a beet collection, you can have a white one, a, a yellow one, and you can have a red one, as well as there's one called Chiogia, which uh, is kind of a multiple colored one. So that's kind of neat things that you can do. Kale is, um, you know, I think uh, we're finding out that kale is just such a nutritious vegetable. And I think we could feed and, and you know, if, if we get more people to eat it, you could really uh, uh, increase the nutritional value of, uh, uh, of all the people who, who are eating vegetables. But... Um, a lot of different things that you can do with kale. And some of the ones that, that you might want to try, this is Lacinato kale. It's also known as Tuscan kale. And uh, another name for it is dinosaur kale. It's a beautiful plant. And Thomas Jefferson grew this one. And just kind of a neat plant. Uh, I think that texture is just kind of uh, uh, really pretty in the garden. And uh, a lot of people really prefer this, this kale to any others. This is one that um, we are growing this year, 
It's a brand new one. It's called Prism Hybrid. And uh, you'll just note the really frilly leaves on this one. And it is, um, it is an All-America selection winner. We are growing it. We have seed for it. And um, it's just known to not have a lot of stems in it and just be really uh, nutty flavored and an excellent one. So that's uh, one that you might want to try. Another one is Oldenborg Kale. <clears throat> it's a new one as well. And it's again, a kind of an attractive leaf and uh, it does carry some uh, disease resistance with it. Uh, one of my favorites, Brussels sprouts. You know, I don't use or, or really plant Brussels sprouts in the spring. It is a cool season crop, but we have much better luck with it if we start the seed in July. And I always put on my calendar that it's time, uh, put my uh, in my calendar that I wanna start my Brussels sprouts seed in July. And that way I have transplants to put out for the fall garden and it works much better for us as a fall crop than it does as a spring crop. But uh, kind of a fun one to have. And <clears throat> Long Island is a, uh, uh, an old standard Brussels sprouts. And uh, you can see that it, it, uh, the days to transplant, 80 to 150, 15 days. So it is a long season plant and it's much better started in the fall of the year and uh, grown that way. One of the ones that uh, we bought this year is Gladius, <clears throat> and uh, it's a little bit shorter season for, uh, for a Brussels sprout, and we're again going to do that one in the fall of the year and start the seeds in, in July. But this is a new one, and it looks pretty good. Uh, Davino is another one, fairly new one. Um, you know, I, I, uh, <clears throat> you either love or hate Brussels sprouts. I kind of like them. And I always say that, you know, if you haven't had a vegetable and you absolutely hate it, you may just not have had that vegetable fixed properly. Or, and, and Brussels sprouts are things that really off the vine or off the plant, they are so much better than the ones that you buy in the store. So you might want to try some, some that are fresh out of the garden. Cauliflower, <clears throat> one of my favorite plants and one that we're going to actually try to grow here in the spring, but it needs a cool, humid climate. And a lot of times that our springs here in, in this part of the state and in this area generally, it gets hot too quickly and the cauliflower never does well. I always have excellent luck starting my cauliflower in the fall of the year and then uh, using it as a, as a fall transplant in the garden and I get wonderful cauliflower for Thanksgiving, uh, even had it for Christmas before. So uh, you might try that. And one of the ones that is a 1975 All-America Selection winner is Snow Crown. And this is a really neat um, uh, cauliflower in that it is a very short season one. And this is one that you may have good luck if you can find it and grow it in the spring of the year you may get a crop before the, the hot weather starts. Another one that uh, we've got seed for that we're gonna try out at the, uh, the trial gardens is Snow Crown, or I'm sorry, Synergy. Synergy is a really neat one. Uh, you can see that it's just a really uh, vibrant, bright uh, curd or, or head on it, and uh, really looks like it's gonna be uh, a good one for the spring as well. So we're gonna evaluate that as well. Uh, broccoli, one of my favorites. And uh, again, I, I really have a good luck with uh, planting broccoli in the spring. April 1st is a great time to get it out. Uh, I like to um, fertilize it a little bit with starter fertilizer to get it off to a good start. But um, I have great luck with broccoli in the spring of the year. And uh, one of the things that everybody talks about is the cabbage worms and the cabbage loopers. And they will get a lot of these particular uh, coal crops, vegetables, and dipel or spinosad seems to be the best products for controlling them. Both of those products are organic and those are the ones that you really want to kind of take a look at. Um, premium crop, you know, this is an old, old All-America selection winner, 1975, and yet it still is just a great broccoli for us. And uh, it's an old one, 
but and it's a very long season when it's almost 70 days from planting to harvest. But this one, premium crop, seems to do well in the heat of the summer, or it can tolerate that and still give you a nice crop. I've grown that for many, many years, and I really like it. Uh, artwork is a new one. You can see the type of heads you get off of it. The little florets, you just uh, can pick those. And really, um, it's got a, a following in some of the gourmet uh, restaurants, uh, things like that. And um, a really, uh, you can harvest it over a long period of time. So take a look at that one. Carrots. One of the things that I, I really like is to grow carrots, and they are tough to grow in our clay soils. But you've got to get them in the ground between March 15th and the 1st of April. And I really like to, um, to get them out. And I, I actually will seed them pretty heavily and then thin them as I go along. If you don't thin them and give them at least an inch between each plant, they aren't going to produce good carrots. And also, if you can really amend your soil, organic matter, I have even added for carrots, I've added a little bit of sand to my soil and worked that in and just really tried to make it a, a really good, heavy drainage, well-drained soil and just a, a good, good place for the roots of that carrot to, to, to get established. Uh, Thumbelina, one of my favorites, 1992 All-America Selection winner. It's round and short and it does well in heavy clay soils. And you know, if you're gardening with kids, I don't think there's a better uh, vegetable than to grow some carrots. Out of the garden, they are just as sweet as they can be, and um, you'll really uh, get a following if you have some of these. And Thumbelina is, a, is a, another old 1992 All-America Selection winner, but a, a really good one for us. And some of the interesting things that you can do, this is Purple Haze. It's a 2006 All-America Selection winner, and that is honestly the color that it, it looks like when it grows, when you pull it out of the ground. But you have got to have deep, well-drained kind of um, soils. When I was a um, uh, vegetable um, uh, field person for a vegetable processing company, uh, we were up in Michigan, and we grew carrots as a... Um, uh, we had a 500-acre carrot fields in various spots around the, uh, the area, and um, it's a beautiful field uh, when you see 500 acres of carrots, but it was a gravelly kind of a, uh, a, um, uh, a soil that um, really supported that kind of deep taproot growth, and that's what you need. And if you can't duplicate that, make sure you don't grow any of the deep-rooted ones because they just won't perform well for us. Uh, Little Finger, another one, really uh, extremely sweet, and again, just uh, a neat little carrot. Uh, I have grown these in containers uh, with, a, with some really good uh, soil mix in those, and they're just kind of fun to have around, and again, wonderful with kids. Red Sun, this is a new one. Uh, it actually, uh, that picture doesn't show it, but it, it has great um, color to it and um, seems to do well in our area but again you can see the soil that it came out of that doesn't look like the soil that we have here in Kentucky so make sure that you if you're going to grow carrots make sure you you take a look at your soil and improve it uh, I, I always love to get the Johnny seed catalog and take a look at the leaf lettuce uh, varieties. I think they have over a hundred different leaf lettuces in there and they actually have mixtures uh, of several different kinds in the same package and you can just put those out and uh, continue to harvest them. You can cut them off and they'll come back a number of times but obviously you need to get them uh, out early in the season. They will not tolerate the, cold, the, the warm weather and so you want to get them out early. Uh, this is one that a fairly new one that we're growing this year called flame lettuce. Uh, I've seen it from a couple of different seed catalogs, but you know if you make a salad with something like that, you've really kind of added a a, a great color to it and um, kind of a, a neat uh, 
combination. This is green ice, another one that we've um, trying to grow this year. We have some, some seeds up for, for this one right now, and we will be uh, kind of transplanting that out in, or out, I shouldn't say that. Gina has already transplanted that out at the, uh, the high tunnel out at the Nature Center. So you'll be seeing that one again. Uh, this is new red fire lettuce. Again, another kind of a leaf lettuce, but um, again, it just gives you that color and a different texture and kind of fun to have. Hampton, uh, you see that frilly growth on that one? Um, that is really kind of a, a, of a neat uh, head there that you can harvest the whole plant with that one and um, seems to do, do well. But again, uh, early in the season is best. Swiss chard, this is one that um, I don't know why more people don't grow it. And I think the reason they don't grow it is they, they really haven't tasted it before. But Swiss chard steamed, uh, it's an excellent vegetable to have, very easy to grow. And you can see this is one called Bright Lights. It's an older one, but it gives you all that different uh, colors in there. And it's just uh, gorgeous in the garden. And this is an old standby, Fort Hook Giant. Uh, they, that, uh, that particular chard has the really the, the wonderful stems on it and it doesn't get um, pithy and it doesn't, get, uh, doesn't develop bitter flavors at all. It, it seems to do really well in our climate. And uh, that's the bright lights. You know, uh, who wouldn't really want to have a, a garden full with, uh, with that color in it? And um, this is a one with the, the red stems, Charbel really nice, nice new one that's out there, bolt resistant, good one. And this is one that we're, we're growing instead of bright lights this year called four star Swiss chard. It's relatively new and supposed to be a little bit better than the, uh, the bright lights. So we're gonna try that one. Spinach, um, you've gotta be early with this. And I really like to get these out into a cold frame in a raised bed and uh, transplant them from uh, under the lights and bring them out and, and uh, get them sown and get them put in the garden as a transplant. And uh, I generally am able to harvest those pretty early in the season. And then I just don't worry about, uh, you know, once it gets hot, you're not gonna have uh, your spinach around very much longer. And just some of the old ones, this the Bloomsdale Long Standing was a 1937. All America selection, been around a long time and still uh, was a good one for us. Melody is a fairly uh, more more recent than the uh, than the Bloomsdale, but uh, 1977 All America winner. Different texture on the foliage, and uh, you know, obviously, you can if you're doing a salad, you could grow two of those together and uh, mix them, and you'd have a different texture in there. And Serengo kind of a new one, uh, new disease resistant. Uh, uh, if you have a planting like that one there, you really need to do some thinning on it. Uh, spinach does need a little bit of space, more so than what it's showing there. And you really need to probably get in there and remove every other plant so that it has a little bit more room to grow. Uh, peas, peas are really one of my favorite vegetables. Not the shell peas, but I love the, uh, the snow peas. And, uh, but um, the shell peas are really fun to have if you can get them out early. It just seems to me that I can get them out in, in sometimes as early as you know March, but it still just gets too hot too fast before I can really get a good harvest from them. But there are some new ones that are coming out that are shorter season, and you can maybe have a better chance of getting them. But um, I just, uh, the, the snow peas are the ones that I grow and I just really, really like them. They're great in stir fries and every other way. When we had them in, out in the gardens, we would ask people to go pick those and they would go out and start picking them and they never returned with any of the peas because while they were in the garden, they would just eat them uh, as they were picking. Uh, sugar snap, that's an old uh, snap pea type uh, 1979 and still a really good one. Uh, one that I still continue to grow. <clears throat> and this is a new one, Pea Snack Hero. 
really neat one. Um, edible pods, perfect for healthy uh, stir fries, things like that. Really neat one. Kind of a different shape to the pod as well. Um, some of the warm season crops. And, you know, when I talk about warm season crops, uh, to me, there's there's two seasons. There's, uh, there's a tomato season and then there's all the other vegetables. And I, um, I'm, I'm really uh, one of those people that, you know, uh, when the tomato season's done, uh, I really kind of go into a little bit of depression because I love fresh tomatoes. And um, I know that we're getting better with some of the off season ones, but you still can't beat one that you just pick from your, your garden and bring into the, into the house. But um, a lot of different, you know, sizes, shapes, colors, everything with them. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the determinant is obviously, um, they, they grow up, the determinant variety grows up and then it stops and it sets all the fruit on that plant at that height. You get a load of fruit at one time and then you don't, um, it doesn't continue to yield as well as the indeterminate. Generally for home gardens, we always like the determinate varieties. Um, people or the, the companies that grow for tomato ketchup and those things, they grow a lot of determinate because they harvest them with a mechanical harvester. They grow through the, the grounds and they can pick up all the tomatoes at one time with a mechanical machine and uh, turn it into um, ketchup. And um, a lot of uh, ways to grow them, either with a cage or by staking. I love to grow them on cages, and, and we have kind of implemented that out at the, the uh, Nature Center demonstration plot. Uh, we've gone to cages for the most part, and um, the master gardeners who volunteer out there really like the cages. It makes it a lot easier to grow. Um, and again, the determinant versus the indeterminate. Um, I, again, for home gardens, I really like the, uh, the indeterminate types. And, um, you know, one of the things about tomatoes, it's the only vegetable besides, I think, um, uh, sweet potatoes that you can bury the stem all the way down and it will root all on that stem. So uh, it's something that uh, you can take advantage of that and uh, if you've got good soil, by all means, dig it, dig them a little bit deeper, and uh, and they will they will root along that whole stem. Um, tomatoes need at least eight hours of sun per day. I think one of the saddest things that I've said in gardening is a tomato plant that that is grown in the shade. It will never do well. It'll never have good tasting fruit on it, and it just kind of struggles. So make sure you've got plenty of sunlight and um, you should be okay with, uh, with growing up. But <clears throat> some of the ones that uh, salad tomatoes, sun sugar is that yellow one that you see up there. Even people who don't like tomatoes love sun sugar because it's very sweet and um, you can get kids to eat them and everything else. Uh, I, um, I, I like it, but I like a tomato flavor and that, that doesn't have enough tomato flavor to me but it is very, very sweet and people love it. Uh, Super Sweet 100, I think it's a real good one. And Matt's Wild Cherry and Cherry Bomb are again, real good cherry tomatoes. Um, this is a new one, Crokini. Um, uh, it's a fairly new one. Uh, I do not have seeds of this one. So we won't, so far we won't be growing that this year. But one of the things I love about it is you can see that you could harvest that whole cluster of tomatoes uh, at one time. And uh, that makes it kind of nice. They all seem to ripen up evenly and uh, that makes it real easy for, for harvest. And matter of fact, you could just clip that whole cluster off and just bring it in and harvest it that way. Some of the paste tomatoes, um, Plum Dandy and Plum Crimson are two of the newer ones. I like the Plum Crimson. I think it's better than the old Roma. Uh, it's got some disease resistance to it. And, you know, Amish paste <clears throat> is just, is a, is a paste tomato, but it has won a lot of the um, uh, taste testing tomato trials uh, with people that they put the Amish paste out there and people prefer that flavor to any other tomato. The only problem I have with it is it does not carry too much re disease resistance. 
and it is one that you probably are going to have to spray a little bit to keep combating some of the early blight and late blight diseases uh, on it. Uh, Juliet is one that we have grown for a number of years. I think it's a really fresh, interesting tomato. Uh, has that kind of shape to it. And again, it ripens very uniformly. We have grown it, I think, out at the Nature Center for four or five years in a row now. And uh, just a really nice tomato, small like that, kind of a salad tomato. And it also was an All America Selections. And I think you can get that from uh, seed from um, Johnny Seed Company as well. Slicing tomatoes. Um, this is where you know you can all you can have uh, family fights over what the best tasting tomato is. And I've got my favorites, but um, I do like Big Beef. I think it's a it's a new one or a newer one. It's what a lot of the commercial growers around here use and it does carry disease resistance and I think it has excellent flavor. Celebrity is an older one and I still think it has really, really good flavor. Mountain Fresh and Mountain Merit came out of the North Carolina breeding program and they're more of a commercial processing type tomato or one for the shipping trade. They have harder skins. Um, I think they're okay. Uh, Defiant is one, it's a newer one from Johnny's and it has a lot of disease resistance. Uh, actually has, I think, a little bit of early blight disease resistance as well as late blight disease, resist, disease resistance. Uh, Galahad, this is one that Joe, Gina, and I trialed last year out at the gardens and we really liked the taste of it. We did a, we had a, a several new tomatoes out there, but Galahad seemed to be one of the newer ones that we thought really was, was one of the best tasting newer ones that we had. But Galahad is a, is a nice one. And it was an All-America selection winners as well. I think it's only about two or three years old. So it's a, it's a new one and the seed is pretty much available. Uh, Marnamar, or Marna, Marnar, uh, it's a new one. Um, it has kind of that uh, heirloom look to it purple beefsteak type, and it has kind of the heirloom flavor, which a lot of people like. Um, and it does, uh, as being new, it's carrying some disease resistance to it, which we really like. Um, I have not tasted it yet, but it, it uh, looks like it could be a, a pretty good one and one that you might wanna, wanna try. Some of the heirlooms, um, um, I, I, I like some of the heirlooms. I just have found that heirlooms don't yield as well as some of the um, some of the newer uh, disease resistant ones. But uh, obviously, Brandywine is one that you hear about. Cherokee Purple. I do think Brandywine has excellent flavor, and I like it a lot. The problem that I have with it is if I get three or four Brandywine fruits off of a plant that's pretty much what I get for the year. And I, I have a big garden and I can put a lot of different plants in it, but if a, but if a tomato is only gonna give me three to four fruits, it's kind of hard for me to justify it. So um, that's one of the problems I have, but that's Brandywine, really pretty. Um, uh, you know, the, the problem, another problem with Brandywine is it goes from being ripe to being overripe in a matter of, of day so you have to be really careful and you can actually pick this a little bit on the green side with maybe a little bit of green shoulders to it and it still will have excellent flavor um, this is one i haven't tried it's a fairly new one buffalosin and um, it um, just has a lot of the the, the late blight resistance good color to it interesting color and um, a lot of people really like this uh, in the trials, liked its, um, the taste to it. Uh, I can't tell you for sure uh, about it because I haven't tried it yet. And uh, it is also an All-America Selection winner. Gin Fizz, this is one that Gina saw and uh, she really wanted to try this one and we have the seeds to it. But it's, um, you can see that interesting uh, uh, tech, or actually the pattern of it when you slice it. It's got some red in there and just some interesting characteristic. 
It's also supposed to be very, very tasty. And, um, uh, you know, I, we're anxious to try it. So we've got seeds for that one. And that one we will have out at the, uh, the Nature Center as well. Uh, peppers, boy, you know, you can just, there, there are millions of these. And um, I've got to tell you, we, uh, out at the Nature Center Gardens, we stay away from the really hot ones. Or we actually don't grow very many hot ones at all. And uh, so you're, you're not going to be able to, to get a lot of uh, good information uh, about some of the hot ones. But uh, we can tell you some, some of the interesting characteristics of the ones that we grow. But a um, lot, of, lot of good ones in the catalogs, if you like that, uh, the heat of them. We just didn't want to have them out there with um, some of the people who were, would be picking and maybe, you know, uh, get uh, touch their eyes or something like that. And then we have had in the past uh, children out there and we just uh, kind of uh, leery of that. Sweet bell peppers, we have had all of these out there, and they've all done pretty well. Red Knight, Aristotle, Early Sensation, Giant Marconi. Uh, we, have, we have really um, had a lot of the, uh, the, the different colored ones, and uh, I like all of them. And just so you know, um, all of these, except for the, uh, the uh, I think, the chocolate ones and uh, the ivory ones, they all start out as green, and if you leave them on the vine, then they will color up, and they just get sweeter and better, I think, the longer they're on the vine up until a point. But um, they, uh, we, we really enjoyed having those. And some of the hot peppers, El Jefe, that's a jalapeno one, really neat one. Holy moly, another good one. And um, there's a, a habanero, or not a habanero, but uh, one called Baron, which is a, um, a really um, neat uh, hot pepper as well that looks to be kind of uh, fun. This is um, really one of um, our favorite peppers. Gina and I uh, and all the master gardeners who, who work out there, we love Carmen. It's uh, kind of a long uh, pepper, long sweet one like that, and uh, just really has... Uh, tremendous sweetness to it and if you leave it until it turns a bright red like that very thick flesh i like to to put them on the grill and grill them but that is an excellent pepper and we've we've grown that for a number of years and uh, really really like it cornito arancha uh it's a new one and we are trying to grow that this year i have um i think we've actually had that in the past I don't think it yields quite as well as the Carmen does, but there is one that um, I um, I have grown a uh, out there for a couple of years now, and it's yellow called Escamillo, and um, I just love that pepper. And if you that Johnny's has that one, if you want something that would could kind of team up with the Carmen, Escamillo will be about the same size or a little bit bigger than Carmen but it'll be a pure golden yellow and just gorgeous. And again, very thick uh, skin and flesh and great for roasting. Aristotle, that's one that you saw before, just a good, uh, wonderful green bell pepper and uh, seems to really yield well. Has a lot of disease resistance, which we really like. Holy moly, F1 pepper. Um, this is one that does, is. Uh, it, it is got some heat to it, but it's not overly hot, but um, beautiful fruit. Uh, and again, this one turns a little bit uh, kind of a dark chocolate color if you leave it on the plant for a while. Eggplant. Uh, that's another one that, you know, we, we just don't have eggplant out at the gardens, out at the nature center, because it just doesn't seem... We donate a lot of this produce uh, to the uh, master provisions, and um, they don't really say that the eggplant goes over all that well. So we try to stick to the things that uh, their clientele really w likes and, and knows how to cook. But eggplant can be kind of fun. I always have several plants in my garden, and uh, if you want different, uh, different colors and different sizes, Hansel, Gretel, and Epic are all real good ones. Epic is the, the, the traditional shape. 
uh, the large kind of purple uh, eggplant and uh, just an outstanding yielder as well. And uh, <clears throat> this is patio baby, which uh, can be grown in a container on your patio. And it has the, the fruit on it is every bit as good as the fruit on a regular sized eggplant. Asian delight, a lot of the different types of uh, Asian vegetables. And um, you can find that seed at um, Johnny's as well. Okra. This is one that, um, you know, not too many people grow this, but um, Clemson Spineless and Cajun Jewel is a fairly new one. There's a Burgundy one as well. Uh, a lot of people who grow it for the first time don't realize that um, you're supposed to pick it when it's very uh, small. And if you let it stay on the plant too long, it just gets to be tough and just almost inedible. So you've got to pick it when it's small and... Uh, it's, uh, it's really a fairly easy vegetable for us to grow. That's Clemson spineless. And I could tell you, you know, when you see that flower, you think, well, the, the flower is beautiful. And it really is. But generally, you don't see it because it's covered with the foliage. But um, it is a pretty plant. Cajun Delight, that's, uh, that's the okra. Again, it's a 1997 uh, All-America selection. But um, uh, that's a... A lot of people don't uh, don't grow a lot of okra. And jambalaya, kind of a smaller one. Uh, I like it. It it's, uh, seems to, to stay small on the plant so that you don't have to be as, as you know, when, I, when I'm growing okra, I need to check it every day to make sure it just doesn't get too big. And this one is one that gives it a little bit more forgiving. Onions. <clears throat> this is something that I'm real serious about. Uh, one of the things in Kentucky is uh, to the north of us, they grow long day onions. And in the south of us, they grow short day onions. In Kentucky, we should be growing day neutral onions. And if you want the big bulbs, look for ones that are day neutral. And um, we have grown these for years. And uh, we actually get the really big bulbs out of these if you select day neutral varieties. And... Um, you want to get them out early. Uh, that's the, the one thing about onions is uh, that you're better off getting them in the ground as soon as you can in the spring. And uh, we usually always get the, the plants, although this year we are growing a lot of onions uh, here at the, the office uh, under the lights uh, by seed. And we're going to see how that does. And we'll, Gina has already planted some of these into the high tunnel, and uh, we're going to see how they do. But uh, harvesting is really important. Uh, when that top starts to go down uh, and starts to deteriorate, you need to get the onions out of the ground. If you leave them in the ground, they will start to rot very quickly and uh, they will not store. Once, once rotting, you know, it's one bad apple, well, it's one bad onion can spoil the whole bunch. So you want to get them uh, up and get them dried in a well-ventilated area. This is one of the day neutral ones. This is candy, and it is just an excellent onion, and that is the one that you should be really trying to, to find and grow. Candy is a wonderful one, and we have a catalog from a company in Texas that will ship you the, the small onion plants, or you can, again, you can buy the seed from Johnny Seed Catalog, or any number of uh, catalog companies are now carrying the day neutral onions. Superstar was a 2001 AAS winner, and you can see it's a, it's a white onion and just gorgeous, and it will get sizable in our climate. It's a day neutral and <clears throat> really a good one for us. Beans. Boy, there's a, this is another one that, that creates kind of a, a controversy because some people like the, uh, the uh, bush beans and others just you've got to have the pole beans and you've got to have white half runners. But um, the bush beans are really so much easier to grow and uh, they, they really are just easier to pick and everything else. And I think there's a good reason for, for, for growing them. But the pole beans, the white half runners still seems to be really popular with people. Kentucky blue are good. But um, bush, we are growing one, uh, we've grown it out at the gardens for the last couple of years called Jade, 
And um, you can see that one there. And Jade uh, just seems to be so uniform. And it really, uh, it, it sets the fruit on there so that you can go through and you will get a sizable picking. And then you can wait two or three days and come back and you will get another sizable picking. I like Romano too. I think that's a really, it's kind of a flat uh, shaped bean. And uh, I think that's a really tasty one as well. But either of those two are very, very good. And uh, those are the white half runners. And um, if you talk to my wife and her family, there is no other bean to grow but the white half runner pole bean. And uh, of course they're stringed, you've got to string them. And I think they're a lot of work, but um, I, uh, they won't hear of me growing anything else but those. So you got to do that. And these are just some of the Secolese pole bean. It's a new one. I honestly haven't had that one, but it's an All-America selection winner. And you can see it's, it's awfully uniform, looks really good uh, from there. Jade, that's the one that um, we have grown out there. And that is honestly, that, that really, um, that looks like it's a staged picture. But honestly, when we pick those, you could get a handful like that and throw it in and they would all be pretty uniform and just, uh, just about perfect. And so that's a, that's a really good bean. Roma 2, that again, as I said, it's a little bit uh, kind of a flatter type bean, and I think it's uh, very good, and uh, I like uh, the Roma 2 bush bean. Summer squash, uh, there's a lot of these, and I know you're getting some of the, the, um, the uh, seeds of some of these, and one of the things that I like to do with my summer squash uh, is I like to put maybe as many as three different plantings uh, during the season and maybe two two weeks apart or so and I like to separate the plants I want to separate the, the ones that I start on May 1st uh, separate those from the ones that I'm going to put in on May 15th and the one that I'm going to put in in June and, and July um, no matter what you do with these they're all going to get mildew disease and if you can kind of separate them that helps because it's usually the older foliage that starts with the disease and then it will spread it to the newer foliage and your newer uh, plantings out there. So if you can move them apart, that helps you a lot. And um, I just don't know of too many people that start with a planting of summer squash on May 1st and are able to carry that through until you know September. You've got to have multiple plantings to do that if you want summer squash throughout the season. And I, I want that. So uh, some of the ones that um, Fortune is a straight neck one. We've got that one. Uh, Dixie, Prolific, those are all really good yellow squash. And of course, uh, the Black Beauty, uh, that's an older one. And if you want a yellow zucchini, the Gold Rush, of course, is a good one. Uh, eight Balls Around one. And Dunja is another one that we're going to trial this year, which should be kind of fun. Fortune, this is one of the ones that we have. You can see it there. Really pretty. Um, you know, good, uh, good size to it. And uh, you want to pick these when they're small and they don't get that kind of size to them. But you can see that's quite a harvest off that one plant there. So that's what you, sh you can expect from that one. Raven, this is one that we've got out this year. And um, really pretty, very uniform. And... Um, I always, you know, I, I judge several of the county fairs as well as the, the state fair in judging uh, vegetables, and everybody always brings in those baseball bats uh, for their zucchini. And, you know, those are never going to win, and they're not what we're looking for. You want to harvest these when they're small. So, um, and, and they can go from being that size to a baseball bat, I think sometimes within hours, but definitely within a few days. And they're just too big. And if you want to shut down production from your zucchini and squash plants, don't pick them. And, you know, the more you pick from those, the more they're going to continue to set new fruit. So uh, don't let the old fruit sit on your, your plants. Pick it, get it out of there, and they will continue to set fruit. Um, goldfinch, this is another one that Gina saw, and she really kind of liked it. And, uh, so we are going to be growing that one this year. And it's, um, 
you can see that's a kind of a crook neck a little bit and uh, really pretty. And uh, so we're gonna, gonna trial that one as well. Lemon Sun, that's a patty pan squash. Uh, you know, if you want something with a little bit uh, different color into it, should be kind of a, a fun one to have. And, uh, you know, if you like that, that patty pan type squash. Winter squash, well, you know, I, I, there are so many different kinds and they all seem to have a little bit of a different flavor to them. And I really like them all. And I, I like to start my winter squash a little bit later in the season because as a winter squash, these things store a while and you can pretty much eat them, well, not, not the entire winter, but well into the winter. And um, so I don't, I don't want to be picking these in July. I want to pick them in September and October so that they store. And uh, there's a lot of good ones. Uh, pumpkins, uh, you know, there, there's, we have tried to do a lot of different uh, things with kids with pumpkins. And of course you can eat the seeds. But they have just exploded in the breeding of different types of pumpkins. And there are just some really fun ones to grow. And again, if you're gardening with kids, um, uh, you know, get the Johnny Seed Catalog. And I keep saying them, Harris, uh, there, there's several companies that have great seed selections. But you can really grow some unusual pumpkins and a lot of fun to grow them. Um, this is an old, old uh, All-America selection. Connecticut field pumpkin, and there's probably a um, lot newer ones than maybe some better ones with some more disease resistant. This is Cinderella's carriage pumpkin. Again, a 2014 uh, winter, different, uh, different shape to it. Uh, squash Goldilocks, uh, looks like a pumpkin, but that is really a, an acorn squash with excellent flavor and uh, kind of a, of a neat one to have. Uh, this is one that I found out about. I have a friend who lives in Cleveland, and she said that at their farmer's market, all of this, uh, this honey nut squash was just kind of the rage that everybody was buying it. And um, she said that um, it, it's, uh, it is a cross between an acorn and a butternut squash. And she said people would just slice it like that grill or, or um, roast it, and, or bake it and not add any kind of embellishment to it. And it was just wonderful flesh and excellent. It does take a long growing season. It, it's not a, a typical winter squash and that this one takes 105 days, but you might want to try that one. And uh, we are giving you some seeds of that one. I'm anxious to see how you like it. Starry Night. This is an acorn squash and we grew this last year and uh, everybody really did like it. Different, uh, different kind of uh, color to it. It's uh, speckled like that and um, really kind of a, of a neat one. And we really did um, the uh, one that was sliced and uh, baked, it was, it was excellent and we, we liked it. And this is a new one, a Butter Baby. It's a butternut squash. And you know, some of the butternut squashes are really large and maybe it's, they're too large for, you know, a family of two or three. And um, this one is smaller and uh, seems to, uh, to have great taste. And again, just a little bit, a uh, little bit smaller. Cucumbers, uh, we have done these for, for a number of years out there. And of course you can do uh, pickling cucumbers as well as all different types. There's um, seedless ones and uh, just uh, all kinds of ethnic ones, but um, we, we grow them. Diva is a really smooth skin one, very pretty uh, cucumber. It's um, uh, just, just a, a really nice uh, heavy yielding um, cucumber. And the burpless ones, these are ones that are parthenocarpic. They don't have seeds to them. Uh, the seed is very expensive, but um, they, are, they are very, very sweet. And uh, a lot of people, when they, when they start going with some of the, um, these type, the greenhouse type of cucumbers, they will not go back to the other kind. They're just very bitter free and uh, just excellent quality. This is another one we're trying this year, and I can't, U-N-A-G-I, uh, and it's a 
spineless one, very small seeds in it, and uh, prolific yielder. And uh, it's uh, gynecious, which um, it has male and female flowers uh, differently on the same plant. Uh, not the same flower, but in two different flowers. One's female, one's male. And um, it's, it's another kind of a neat one that we're going to trial out there at the gardens. Sweet corn, I, I just, um, you know, any of these sweet corns that you can harvest from your garden and bring in uh, are just outstanding. And we have a lot of people don't grow sweet corn because it just takes up so much room and you only get one ear per, per one stalk. And, uh, but um, boy, if you can grow it, it sure is fun to have because it's, uh, there's nothing better. And um, Bodacious is a, uh, one of the sugary enhanced ones. You know, they've come out with uh, these things that when you used to be, when you, when you picked your sweet corn, you should have the water boiling in the house, run it down there and throw it in the water so that because the sugars would, would go during the starch right away, that doesn't happen anymore. We're getting um, some of these sugary enhanced ones that they will stay sweet. And um, I guess, uh, you know, some of the ones back in the, uh, oh, I guess it was the 80s when that started out. And uh, they have really kind of kind of changed the way that um, we, we've thought about sweet corn. This is a new one, Pack Out. Um, it's a bicolor and uh, really a, a neat, you can see that's just a beautiful sweet corn. how sweet it is or sweet how sweet how sweet it is and um, a really nice yellow or I'm sorry a, a white sweet corn really pretty um, and uh, you know obviously we have some insect problems with it but if you do a little bit of uh, even some biological control of them uh, you can have sweet corn that that, that is that pretty and uh, just bring it in and have a way with it. Um, melons we have um, we had a uh, a really good year last year for melons. Uh, had a couple of farmers market growers who um, who grew them, and uh, they did really well with them. What, one of the things about um, growing melons is is that they really need a a dry period when they're ripening up. If we get a lot of rain during that period, it kind of dilutes the flavor of them. So we want it to be a good growing season, but then when they're ripening, to kind of turn off dry. And that's when you want to stop all irrigation with them. And that's true of your cantaloupes as well as your watermelon. A lot of us have been growing sugar baby, and that's one that we have, um, that's a watermelon. It's a smaller one, and uh, it's one that you're getting some seeds from, and I think it's a, it's a really nice one. Early moonbeam, another one that's good. Sugar Cube is a cantaloupe, and um, Jim Crawford has told me about this one, and it's a smaller type of cantaloupe, kind of an individual uh, size, but just an excellent one. He's been growing that one for years, and he has given me some uh, fruit from that one, and it really is a, a tasty plant. But that's a Sugar Baby, and that's the one that we're going to give you some uh, seeds from. It's been around a while but just uh, uh, an excellent, and it's a little bit smaller size, which most people seem to prefer. Uh, this is Yellow Doll, and um, Jimmy Scott, this is one that he's kind of famous for. Or he grows this one, and uh, he uh, just uh, has a following for people who, who want the Yellow Doll watermelon. So that's one that you might want to think about trying if you have the room for, for watermelons or cantaloupes. Mambo, uh, neat, another one, fairly new. It's an F, it's an AAS winner. Um, you know, it just looks to be kind of a, a the old type of uh, uh, skin to it, and uh, not many seeds, but uh, really nice flesh to it. Sugar Cube, that's the one that I was talking about. Um, that's the one that um, Jim Crawford grows, and looks to be um, really a a good one and it also carries a lot of disease resistance and that's something that we really like. Athena, this is one that I got, um, one was, was in our trials at um, Dr. Baird's farm last year and uh, the customers that he had just loved the Athena melon 
and he had people coming back for this one. And uh, it's a five to six pound one, does carry a lot of disease resistance, but it has what, what everybody wants. It has excellent flavor. So Athena is one that you might want to try. Grizzlet, this is another one that um, we saw in the catalog and thought that we really wanted to try it. The seeds of this are very expensive. And so we just have maybe about 20 seeds, but we're gonna try it out at the, um, out at the gardens this year and just see what, um, what it, how it does for us. And uh, it's reported to be just um, a really good melon. Sweet potatoes, uh, we grew these out at the gardens uh, many years ago and uh, we had a problem with mice that came in but um, it, it, they're really kind of fun to have and uh, easy to grow. They take a good, do take a long season. And this is a vegetable that you do not want to get in a hurry with at the, at the beginning of the season. They have to have warm soil. It's a tropical plant. You don't want this, this plant to get cold or have cold night temperatures at all. It, uh, it needs warm soil temperatures. I wouldn't even think about planting these slips of sweet potatoes until maybe May 15th or so. And that's only if the, uh, the soil temperature was up quite a bit. But um, pretty easy to grow, pretty plant, um, and uh, good yielding. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, those are just some of the things that you can, can do uh, when you plant them. But um, it does take a kind of a, uh, uh, a soil, maybe with some organic matter in it so that they can uh, form their, the tubers. So without... Um, you know, a lot of compaction in the ground and they'll, they're fun to have. And these are just some of the Beauregard, it's an old one, uh, been around forever, but just seems to be, you know, the, one of the best ones for us in this area. And then Centennial is the other one. Uh, and then uh, you could, there's, there's many of them and they all do pretty well, but I can tell you that the Beauregard and Centennial are two of the best for us. Or, uh, the garden season gets uh, you get busy but thanks for uh, having us